I'm going to speak about open wearables. Uh, so my field of research right now is wearable technologies, and one of the areas that I'm looking into is open design practices uh, related to technology and to fashion. So just a little breakdown of what we'll be looking at, uh, a little overview of where we fit in modernism, sewing and fashion, and how that gives us a little bit of information of how to think of fashion and technology today. Then we'll look at open design materials and wearables, a little bit of eye candy to see what people have been making. And specifically, one of the things that I'm interested in is um, the various access to technologies, to knowledge and practices that really shape the field. Because wearables, as a practice is really undefined. It, it's very large, it's happening in medicine, in military, uh, there's a bit in fashion, a bit in textile industries, all kinds of areas are dabbling in it, and uh, there's no one way that it's really happening. So it means that there's different interpretations, and specifically different material interpretations of what wearables can be. And then I'll speak about electro mode, and we have a little show and tell. Um, so essentially, well, just a little bit of background information on the history of modernism. Uh, if we look back even just at the turn of the century, so the beginning of the 1900s, we didn't really have things such as fashion designers. Essentially what we had was producers of various garments. They were technical craftsmen, but they were not personas, and they didn't really have the status of designers. Um, so uh, companies such as Louis Vuitton was essentially a, a luggage maker, and they transitioned into copywriting their logo and becoming kind of arbiters of style through that legacy. Um, so if we look at um, sort of the, the very sort of short moment at the turn of the century where the idea of a fashion designer begins, and historically this is quite exciting because you have this shift into modern technologies, and you also have people like Baudelaire and Mallarmé, very famous philosopher writers, who are writing about fashion. And I think we don't have much of that today. I don't know a lot of philosophers who are thinking that fashion is an interesting way of analyzing or of showing our relationship to technology and to the changing world. Um, so I'm gonna focus on Paul Poiret. He's a very strange egg. He is really this sort of grand uh, uh, character. He's the first to um, essentially um, design his persona as a fashion designer. Uh, he was friends with many artists of the time and he was really trying to carve a place for himself as an artist. So the person who makes clothing as an artist. And of course, this is also happening in a modern context. You have these individual personas that are becoming quite famous. So he does things which are, in the fashion world, completely normal nowadays. He has a muse. It's um, Denise. She's just a very young girl from the countryside with no experience, no background, and he models her. She's sort of an empty vessel. And she becomes a sort of spokeswoman for him. And what's more is he invents a lot of the things that are a kind of paraphernalia performance and objects that surround fashion. So he's the first to make um, a... He's the first to make a, a perfume named Rosine. He designs his own textiles with Atelier Martin. Uh, he also invents the runway show. Uh, he makes costumes for theater, for film, for movie stars, all the stuff that any respectable fashion designer would do today. He invents, so it's quite exciting. Um, and he also has these kind of thematic soirees, a kind of bohemian aesthetic. Everyone has to show up dressed in the right aesthetic in order to get in. So, you know, there's a bouncer. <laughs> um, but I think what's quite interesting about this era is he's also operating at the cusp where we have a lot of mainstream technologies, such as the sewing machine, which are entering the home and the general public. So there's a nice synchronous thing that happens where the invention of the designer, the persona that you know, comes with the fashion item is also happening at the moment where you have a democratization of the tools needed to make these fashions. Um, so every respectable family has a sewing machine. We're also entering the realm of communicating um, through templates such as um, uh, knitting patterns and various uh, other kind of fabrication patterns, that this becomes quite popular. So when we think of today's DIY context, I mean, we have to remember that this was really existing at the turn of the century. And it 
also goes even to things such as uh, the popularity of home kits. So through Sears, you could buy your own home kit and build it yourself. So sometimes uh, I'm a little bit frustrated when people feel like, oh, we are such great makers. And in fact, if you look back about a century, uh, we were still applying that kind of ingenuity, the ingenuity of the everyday person that sort of uh, Christina talked about. Now, something funny happened to Paul Poiret. In all of his tremendous ambition, uh, he sort of shot himself in the foot because he became really popular in America. He was traveling to New York regularly, and um, people essentially started imitating his style because it was quite particular. Um, so that meant that there were fake Paul Poirets all over New York City. And he was trying to get a handle on how to control that, how to, in essence, control his brand. Um, now, you didn't really have um, trademarking, but this is where they copyright the trademarks and the design. This is where the invention of the copyright of fashion happens, which is also in terms of open design practices, um, from technology to fashion, you, the moment where that happens, everything changes a little, a little bit. Um, so every, all of the famous fashion designers signed documents and really were protesting uh, this plagiarizing of their craft, of their design craft. Um, but ultimately, the funny solution that Poiret came up with was to distribute patterns, which in a way was, is, in my interpretation, advocating for... Um, for the distribution of the knowledge to be accessible to all. So it was quite common for fashion designers to um, have their, their designs produced and uh, authenticated all over the world. So you can find famous fashion designers and um, labels where they're made in Brazil, and it says that it's uh, an authentic copy of this of, let's say, um, Schiaparelli or other sort of famous turn-of-the-century designers. But what he does, and he's one of the first, is to really make the pattern, to put the pattern out there. And we all sort of know what happens when we get a sewing pattern. Essentially, we, uh, we modify it, we customize it, and we create our own kind of aesthetic around it. So um, I want to sort of use that example to talk about how that gives us some idea of what can happen in wearable technology. So, Wearable technologies, this is Steve Mann, this is sort of the birth of the idea, it's very techy. it's the idea of wearing a computer device on your body, and certainly the technologies and the thinking around that has changed dramatically. One of the very important contributors is Leia Bukley, along with Arduino platform, to create textile, I'm still getting, I don't know what to do to stop this funny feedback. Is it, do I need to puff out? I'm breathing too heavily. Does that work better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm just a heavy breather, I guess. <laughs> I'll stop that. Okay. Um, so anyhow, Lilypad Arduino. Uh, so I think many of you will be familiar with this. Uh, but I think what Arduino really did, um, which is not too... Let's, you could probably put it as far away from my mouth as possible. I'm a loudspeaker. <laughs> um, but I, the, the language, democratizing the computational language so that uh, low entry people can really participate in making computational devices with textiles. I'm so physically maladapted for this mic, I guess. All right, we'll keep trying. Um, is also, is really one of the important things. Um, so we also have uh, communities um, like uh, Adafruit, who's contributing to that field, and Anio Magic, which is another platform. So again, the moment that you have one platform, you have other platforms replicating and sort of solving problems. So in this platform, for example, you can program all of the wearable devices just via the screen. So you don't even need to know any of the Arduino language. And then, of course, distribution of materials. So just on a basic level, uh, if we analyze how we can make something open, well, part of it is getting your hands on things. And it's, so it's no surprise that a company such as SparkFun, which is not a very old company, is like a multi-billion dollar company now just distributing electronic parts. So this kind of DIY hacker um, kind of, you know, kit maker mentality has really, really, um, you know, been absorbed uh, and been embraced uh, by that. The other thing that happened in terms of wearables is we started having researchers that were really staking a place for that area of research in terms of aesthetics. So these famous books by um, Sabine Seymour. And then we have a number of books that attempt to create templates, DIY, uh, 
practices and uh, making these accessible to people. Um, so this is Susie uh, Pachian's uh, Fashioning Technology, Fashion Geek, Alison Lewis. All of these books and people are really active in the field and really shaping it. And Otto von Busch, uh, his take is more in terms of hacking uh, fashion. And then, of course, in terms of opening up that field, how a lot of people gain access. I mean, the sort of the, the new catalog is, of course, the internet. So I like to say that the internet didn't really invent anything in terms of dissemination of, of knowledge in terms of craft making, but it just created a new, faster, more collaborative platform for people to do so. Uh, so sites like Instructable or Craft or Fashioning Tech or Talk to My Shirt are really great places to find information and to find sort of crafting ideas and ways around that, ways around developing and piggybacking over things that happen. This is How to Get What You Want by um, uh, Mika Satomi and Hannah Perner wilson and Plusea, as well as uh, this is Open Materials website. Again, Adafruit. So the important thing about this is you have this kind of explosion of information, of platforms that people can build on. I teach uh, at Concordia University, and I think anyone who teaches a kind of material design practice will know the difference between when you taught before the internet and after, if anyone else knows, and the, the sort of the, the, the level of access to information that students have today that can really shape what happens within the classroom context. Um, so the other aspect is uh, th via the internet, uh, we have access to not only uh, different practices, perhaps ordering different materials that come into the lab, but also um, uh, sites such as Thingiverse where you can share um, 3D designs with other people. So if you have no knowledge of 3D design, you can get a design already. You can possibly modify it, contribute to it. So again, this sharing of information and then the physical spaces such as we had many presentations today about Fab Labs. So meeting spaces with greater access to the technology. And this is impacting wearables uh, quite significantly. And um, the, uh, there are media spaces such as V2, and they are quite important in terms of thinking and designing wearables. Susan Cozell, uh, her Whispers project with Tekla Shiphorse was a very important precursor to that. And um, places like iBeam also, who have really supported wearables as a, a kind of making practice, but also as a place to have the designs disseminated. Because again, as I was saying, it's a field that's being interpreted differently by many different people, but in terms of dissemination platforms, um, people are also trying to invent. I mean, is it an artwork? Is it a fashion work? Does it go in a design exhibition? Most of it, unfortunately, just ends up being documented on the internet, and that's that. So it's sort of, I put that in the category of, uh, it's a prototype, I filmed it, and now it can just sort of go somewhere and die. Um, it's on the internet, and that's all that really matters about it. I always have this argument with my students where they show me incredible th things on the internet, and I love it when it's something that I've seen, and I can tell them how actually horrible it was in person, or how it really didn't do that, or it only did that once. Um, so, I mean, we know that we do that, but in a way, anyhow, those are kind of constructed lies. So, um, we, we're all participating in that. Um, so, the other way in which sort of the internet and access to technologies is changing wearables is being able to network with big fancy machines and specialized technicians. So, such as 3D printing, I think, is one really great example of that. You don't necessarily need to own the machine or even go to the machine. You can send files, you have it rapid prototyped, built somewhere else, and sent to you. And this is something that has been really specifically embraced um, by um, people in fashion tech. So you have places such as Shapeways, Nervous System do all of their design on this based on this practice. The textile lab is in, at Kent State. They're opening it up to the public. So again, a lot of the research in this field often happens um, in academic institutions. And if we're going to talk about opening up the field, academic institutions are often in my experience, not necessarily the most open places because you can't necessarily just walk into them. As a fashion designer, if you have your own business, you wouldn't really be able to use the equipment there or really you know, network with what's happening. At least our institutions in Canada are often um, a little bit limited by that. Um, and then you have some mainstream designers that really let you sort of like modify and participate. And I think, again, as the interfaces change for that field, you 
we will be able to kind of create your own designs without you know, having this sort of kind of these remote network to experts will really transform what people are able to do. So you could have files and just send them off and have a whole collection made without necessarily having to make it. And this is happening at the kind of low scale, but also the high scale. This was a project by uh, Maison Martin Marghella, and it was the idea of sending out a pattern. So again, you know, we've, we've come all the way from Poiret, who wanted to control the pattern, to the high fashion house, and he actually just put out a collection at H&M. So again, the sort of, I think all of these mainstream fashion um, stores have really capitalized on this idea of kind of blending the high and the low. But having users have an entry point into that and maybe make their own Marte Magiela uh, is super interesting. And then you have, uh, this is a project where you, you draw uh, the kind of dress that you want to do and it has a kind of algorithm that builds it and then she will make it and send it to you. So a kind of interface that you use. Uh, some of, just a couple of the there's, if you think about wearables and if you look at the projects online, most of them are one-offs. I mean, it's a great industry for students to make one piece for one class with a little bit of hot glue and some basic rudimentary skills in sewing, and it's not something that will really make it out into the public. And then at the extreme scale of what's happening in wearables in the professional sense, there's really not that much. So there's Cute Circuit. I just want to mention a few. Uh, there's... Um, Lost Values, she's done a few projects, but mostly focusing now on textiles. Um, okay, I know I don't have, well, I still have some time, it's not so bad. So I wanna talk about sort of the fashion art side. So we've sort of looked at, we have access to practices, we have greater access to technicians, maybe in terms of remote or local places, and um, greater access to pra different practices, so different, ways of making things that people didn't know before. Technosensual was a recent exhibition that I was a part of uh, organizing a colloquium and writing and interviewing many of the artists in it. And it's one of the ex examples of really kind of high fashion wanting to combine with technology. So we have some of the classic pieces, such as uh, this is the Phillips piece that was made, the Boobel, so it's a dress that uh, with a, um, a galvanic skin response can change color based on your sort of mood, how nervous you are. Um, and this exhibition was uh, organized by Anouk Wipprecht. So this is a piece that was made at V2, which is essentially a self-staining or self-painting dress. It's a kind of one event dress. And uh, it has these solenoid valves and a kind of tube of paint piece. So uh, again, combining medical technology, because that's where all of the components were, uh, with fashion technology. We have a 3D printed shoe. This is by Pauline Van Dong. And this was made because of, uh, and we had another presenter today who also showed uh, 3D printed shoes, the name, and essentially the argument is the same. It's way too expensive and complicated to make this in the traditional shoe making techniques of, of wood and carving, and the delays are much too slow, and it wasn't really her desire to make a 3D printed shoe per se, but to make one quickly and economically. And so the, this was done in collaboration with Freedom of Creation. Um, and they put out this shoe, which got a lot of buzz and really made fashion designers start thinking of how they could use this technology. Iris van Herpen is a very good example of someone who's pushed um, the capacities of that to a very fashion, you know, a very fashionable and dramatic way that um, I think has captured the imagination of many people. Of note, um, she is one of the few who does not have a couture house in Paris who showed at the recent uh, Parisian haute couture runway shows. So clearly people are looking towards that. And then Iris van Herpen, um, uh, and she's Dutch based. 10 minutes? Yep, yeah, I'm good. Um, so other collaborations are collaborating with technologies and companies who have a long-standing relationship to making things and want to maybe combine uh, new technology practices. So this is the Climate Dress by Diffus. They're a Copenhagen-based firm. And um, they've been collaborating with Foster Rohner which is an old, very old company, um, Swiss company that makes embroidery. They make all of the beautiful lace, brisiere, lingerie, uh, you know, Prada dresses that have lace, et cetera. And in order to diversify, because lace is a very 
trend-related kind of fabric where for a couple seasons it's really hot and then nobody wants it. They're looking into creating circuits. These are circuits with solar cells, with LEDs. So they're adapting their technology to include that. And these collaborations of designer with these very high-tech firms is quite important. Another example is um, stretchable circuits. And they're, um, their funding comes from um, the uh, Fraunhofer, uh, which is a very large research institution in Brazil. And they're at the IZM in Berlin. And so they've created um, kind of offshoot company based on all of the research that's happening there to create circuits which would really be possibly integrated into wearables. Um, right now, the big challenge, this is one company, uh, Moon Berlin, who's used uh, their circuits, is that it's too expensive. One circuit is about 700 euros. Uh, it's still super fragile, um, and there's a lot of issues with connectors, basically hard to soft. How do you make that bridge? I mean, we still don't have really soft circuits. I mean, we have parts of it that are soft, uh, but we don't really have something that we can print. We can print part of the circuit, uh, but um, not to the extent that one would like to uh, in order to wash it and wear it like everything else. Another great example in terms of accessing technologies is sometimes looking to old technologies. So this is Anya Hartenberger and Meg Grant. And what they did is they went to an old lace, a living lace museum. So essentially, it's a museum with a bunch of technology and it, one or two technicians who still knows how these lace machines work. And they collaborated uh, with them to create this lace dress that has embedded uh, conductive threads which read, uh, which, through which you can, with a reader, uh, have sound readings. So you can basically listen to the dresses. So I think in terms of opening, sometimes the opening is not about maybe the newest thing, but maybe it's about reinventing old technology. This is a beautiful embroidered dress which, um, when there's water contact, it begins to cry. It's a mourning dress to bring to a funeral. Ying Gao, uh, interactive dresses, they're responsive to movement. And then I also want to just throw out there that sometimes technology is not necessarily circuit-based. This is Suzanne Lee's uh, cruelty-free leather. It's basically cellulose and tea-based fabric, which she makes outside in the sun. It's sustainable. Um, it's, it, it's sort of like grow your own fabric kind of thing. And I think these are areas that are really worth looking at. And a different example in terms of kind of openness and transparency, there's a big trend in fashion and design to give the information in terms of where do things come from and what are they made of. And in this case, this is Christine uh, Mindersma. She did a one sheep sweater project in which she took care of a flock of sheep, or, or with a farmer, and then uh, they shaved each individual sheep, and they made one sweater from each individual sheep. And in a way, even when we think of data mapping, I mean, this is a kind of material data mapping. Each sheep, depending on whether or not it was sick, or ate a lot, or its kind of size and, and health, uh, produced a different amount of wool. So you have a different sweater. Okay. So the last little bit, I'll talk about Electromode. Um, I had done a few projects in wearables, and much like many people, um, it essentially involved trying to invent something without any back catalog of how, um, piggybacking on things that existed, making it once without necessarily properly archiving how it was made. So, I mean, you know, when you're just trying to problem solve, you're not going to stop and you know, take notes or, ha or film yourself trying to problem solve. Sometimes you make things, you get it to work, you come back to it a week later, you forget why it worked that way. It just does work. And often making things which were very fragile, so very short-lived and not really entering into the public domain the way that fashion does in a general sense. I mean, of course, we have these big show pieces, but w if we think of wearable, we would like things to also exist in the real world. Um, so I wanted to make it easy for myself, and I started to create recipes with circuits. And just going back to the lily pad because it was very stable. Actually, I tried to make my own circuits, and we spent a year, an engineer and I, and then when we looked at it, we had exactly designed a lily pad <laughs> because we had asked ourselves all of the same questions in terms of what we wanted. It was just maybe a little bit simpler, but it really wasn't worth then to go into production. Um, and then the other thing was just, you know, how do you, how do you hook it up? What I wanted was a recipe book. So I wouldn't have to think about the technology too much as I was making it. So I could say, well, I think I would like to use a um, light sensor and maybe 
let's just use LEDs for now. I mean, the, for right now, that's what I've been testing with. And let's actually try to make it really super pretty and make it wearable um, in all the different senses. So uh, we have fabric printers at Concordia, and we started printing um, the so the, the design of the garment, so the pattern of the garment. We started uh, printing uh, kind of customized textile because you can, and then we printed all of the information. So in one document, and you can imagine that the process of this involves a lot of graphic layout, um, we sort of put everything on there, and then you just sort of make it. Um, you can make it yourself. And here's a few examples. Mm, hold on, it's a little bit sleepy. Oh, okay. Um, the other thing that we made was, um, oh, the image is a bit dark. So the dress was a bit complicated, so uh, we decided to make a, a bag. And again, it's, it, it's a lot of graphic layout. Oh, sorry, it seems to be. Um, okay. Um, and then another recent project that we made actually was a competition to dress Barbie, which did not at all conflict with my ideals of the world. <laughs> I still have my Barbies and I like dressing them up. Um, so we made a kind of interactive light dress for Barbie. We, we didn't win, but still. Um, so in this case, we had the fabric woven by a local weaver and then we made all of the fabric printed out with the circuits and built it all. And then the recent project that I'm making now is based on Sonia Delaunay, who's a really, Again, one of these modernist kind of multidisciplinary designers. Um, she ran a atelier simultané, which was a kind of her her design answer to pointillism. So the idea that two things together could be transformative, which I think makes sense for fashion and technology. And she was also a really fantastic um, graphic and print designer for textile, and a lot of. But she also painted cars. She's a really sort of interesting person. So here's just one example. The process essentially is uh, hand drawings scanned, then laid out into a kind of uh, pattern, a circuit that's laid out, and then combining the two, we can put them together. I don't know if you can see where the circuit is, but essentially we've really embedded exactly where it would go, just gra just representationally. And then we have um, Katarina, who's wearing this one right now, so we can actually sort of see. The the object. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, can I take this off now or still? Uh, and I'll just turn it on, but just so that you can see what it, I think I can do it from here, what it feels like, because sometimes, uh, I think if you shake your hips. And so it's really simple, but it, it's something, I mean, what I like about it is that we have 16 different of these, so four designs, two tops, one skirt, one dress. Uh, each of them in four different color schemes, and we could actually reproduce them, but I can also, you know, sell it to someone who can make it. And the, you know, the fashion designer who doesn't know much about technology really doesn't have to think that much about it. And the engineer who thinks, well, maybe I could make a dress for my girlfriend, or maybe I want, I'm a female engineer, of course, and I want to make myself a dress, but I really don't know about dressmaking. It sort of builds that bridge between those two um, kind of skill sets. So for me, that was my answer for opening up the field, was making it as simple as possible. Great, thank you for wearing it. <laughs> it just looks, it looks nice on a person, so, and it looks beautiful on you, so thanks. Great, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much for that, Valérie. Um, can I just, that comes as a kit, so you would send you the, leave it on the pattern. You can it's okay. Would you yeah. send the pattern and the fabric and the hardware out to people who wanted it? Um, well, everything comes right? in one, so, so you have the, the pattern of the dress is printed onto the textile, and so is... Um, just if I go back, so is where the circuits should be. So, I mean, you could just order SparkFun. You could order all the parts, and then you could order this dress. You could also order in different colors. Or, or you, I mean, ultimately, if we had a kind of platform like I showed some of the ones in mainstream design where, um, like Berta Style and uh, there was another company where you can modify some of the prints or modify some of the elements. So this is a big trend in fashion is to be able to pick your own color of shoe, Reebok did it, and things like that. So if we had that web platform, we could do that. But for now, it was more the idea that, well, essentially, um, I mean, most of the wearables out there are incredibly expensive. And or maybe some people don't really have the 
not design skill, that seems like a judgment, but maybe they don't have the time to really consider those aspects. So it was a way of kind of a proof of concept, a really a prototype to see, can we make something that would be just um, a kind of low entry point into wearable technologies, hence how, why we have LEDs as well. I'd like to open up for questions now, questions, comments. I really like your presentation, <laughs> and I'm really curious about uh, the dress uh, because you 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 say can you shake your hips? Does it uh, do something with movements? Is it? Yeah, so it has an accelerometer, and we just it just has three different. It could be more complex, but it has three different states uh, based on uh, I'm moving, so uh -huh. it does one sequence, uh, and I'm not moving, so it does another sequence, and then, well, wait a minute, I haven't moved in a while, so then <laughs> it does another sequence. And uh, to be honest, that, that series of sequence we had cooked up for the bag, and so we just recently finished, uh, and it, it, like anything that sort of when it finally works and is finished, it looks really simple, like, oh, I bet I couldn't do that. But it's actually about nine months worth well, to do all of the 16 pieces that we have of doing lots of, you know, Illustrator and lots of corrections on the document. It's a bit like producing a catalog, but without necessarily, you know, knowing in advance where you're going to go with it. So those are the parts. But you can make it. You, you could, I mean, really, you just need to know how to sew. You can look at it. So part of the circuit, it's made with conductive threads, and we just, uh, we just machine sew it. You can bottom feed it, and there's a, but there is a special kind of thread that works really well, and that's trial and error. Uh, I used a lot of other threads that didn't, but. Thanks. Any other comments? Yeah. One, and then was there one back there after? Um, you, you said you used a lot of um, other thre threads. Um, why did you not use the lily, the threads that came with the lily pad, or was that not? They're crappy. All right, okay. <laughs> they're, they're great. Um, you can use it if you want to do, if you want to use the thermochromic paints, they work really well because they do a lot of uh, resistive heating. And I, I don't know why that's the one that ended up with that, but these are by Carl Grimm. It's an, again, an old German company that made threads, decorative threads uh, for over a hundred years, and now they've sort of transitioned into kind of smart textiles because uh, silver is being used in order to to be antibacterial. It's also being used, um, you know, to to make things cleaner in, to a certain extent. Of course, if you're going to talk sustainability, silver is actually quite bad because when you wash it, it leaks into the water. I mean, the technology and fashion and sustainability is a whole other really complicated can of worms. And, I, d and uh, I tested them all because I worked for Silk du Soleil and we wanted to make uh, these leotards with circuits. And so we ordered every thread possible, so. I was gonna say, and, and being washable, how is this uh, being washed? I, I'm asking for a reason because I have a bunch of lily pads and students who yeah. want to do some things. Um, in practice, and also, I mean, th in theory and practice, you can wash it. But I think that realistically, um, Probably you want to treat this like a sort of couture garment where you're going to spot wash certain parts and really avoid that as much as possible. And that's just a kind of reality. Like I really did go to the top of the food chain in what's being done in these kind of circuits with um, threads. And um, the work that I showed by um, that Moon Berlin does, which is the stretchable circuits, is really top of the line. And they do... Uh, um, what is it? Their, their department really looks at uh, looks at how things, um, how robust things can be. So they do tests like we're going to wash this 80 times and put it in the dryer 80 times, and they have, it, yeah. So and this is a multi-million industry. They're doing research like for Mercedes is looking like how they can make uh, cars lighter or integrating technology into seats and things like that. So the smart textiles area, you know, goes well and. The automotive industry is always very avant-garde-ish in terms of, you know, that's why people buy new cars. So they're always willing to test. And even there, they've yet to really find the solution. I mean, maybe in a car it's better because you don't wash it <laughs> that much. But, yeah. yeah. Thinking back to when I 
worked on the Whisper project in wearables, which was from 2002 to 2005, which feels like the dark ages now. The, the big challenges, some of them you've addressed, one is the question of softness and stretchability. The other is uh, washability. But the third that really caused us problems was power supply. And also the amount of power that you could actually run through soft circuits, because there were some things that could be made soft, like the, what was it, the, the actual electricity power supply or the battery power supply at that time had to be an insulated cable, whereas yeah, the, whereas the um, activating the LEDs could, could be thread. So my question to you relates now to the, the battery function and how, how recyclable or how small the batteries have become and the, the question of conducting the, the current from one part of the, the garment to the other and, and how small and light the, the um, fibers can be now. Yeah. Well, this certainly is not an, an example of the most cutting edge technology. What, in terms of this project, the idea was to create something that everyone could get their hands on. But even there, what we have is we have small three volt batteries because LEDs take almost no electricity and it, they it, there's only one part where the threads cross and if you just put fabric it actually insulates it so you really it doesn't need to be super high tech that was just something we discovered along the way and uh, these batteries are rechargeable so I there's also uh, batteryjunction.com <laughs> the world of batteries has really changed uh, but now there are flexible batteries of course uh, you know various kinds of solar cell piezo electronics I think there's all kinds of really interesting ways of solving that big battery pack issue um, and I, I, I think you know more and more we'll, we'll see those I think there's solutions there's a question down at the back here Uh, hello, Valérie. Um, Salut. <laughs> I, I know you've been doing that. We've been talking on the dark age. So you've been doing that for 10 years now or something. Not, uh, uh, it's a good time. I mean... Uh, six, seven. Seven. No, wait. Because I, I was part of that a little bit, like working with Joey and uh, Barbara Lane. And how would you see the difference from back then to now? Like, who approached you now? And, because back then, it was something that was really dark and not many people <laughs> doing it. But w what's the evolution of this right now? Is there more people interested in that? Uh, people want to commercialize it a bit more? Or um, what's the difference now than seven years ago? Yeah. So, well, I mean, the first wearable that I did, we had to build our own circuit. So a lily pad didn't exist. I mean, there was no economical off-the-shelf solution. And a lot of the projects that were being done, like you mentioned, uh, so Joanna Berezowska is a professor at my institution, and so is Barbara Lane. And uh, <laughs> David teaches, you're still at CIID? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't know if people know you or, okay. And um, so essentially you had a lot of uh, MIT uh, kind of engineering vision around this uh, because everything really had to be invented. So the big shift that I've seen now is, I mean, I'm mostly in contact with like 20 year olds in fashion who they really want to adopt this. And so it's about making the technology as accessible as possible or creating these bridges between like really kind of you know, high tech industries that are willing to take that on. And I think these industries will become interesting when you have more designers. So if we take the example of Moon Berlin as designers and the stretchable circuits, um, essentially what they had was a stretchable circuit, but how do you get visibility or how do you make it viable on an in kind of industry scale? Will you get people in fashion slash you know, design? So they worked actually with Zane Brezina's students in Berlin to create these designs and to put them out there so that there is a kind of showcase. And I think the role of the designer as well will kind of transform what kinds of technologies people might want. Uh, so what I see is that the field is being um, becoming more and more aesthetic, more design, more focused on kind of the sort of design expressions that we see in fashion from the really extreme scale of the runway, like Iris Van Herpen, these very dramatic, I didn't put Hussein Chalahan in here, but he's sort of someone in haute couture who's done a lot of wearables. Um, and um, so, okay, more fashionable, more accessible. Uh, I had a third one, but I forgot it. Um, oh, and, and more robust. So the big difference with some of these early pieces and which 
my work is part of that, and well, I, I can't, maybe Susan can answer to that as well, but is that they had really short shelf lives. I mean, essentially they were more on par with like a media artwork which might function for a month with a technician willing to come in with a hot glue gun every th third day to make sure that it's still okay or and or reboot the system. And that's great for a media arts event where you have technicians and you have optimal um, you know, controlled conditions, but the moment that you put something on a body, and that's why I wanted to sort of show it really can be worn, um, and that the moment that that person sort of walks out and does things with it, uh, that's kind of transforms it. So I think we're heading in that direction. You've, you've um, described the arc over the past seven years incredibly well, because the project I worked on was in media art context, and it, it was just not viable without having the people there running it. And I think you've demonstrated how we've actually progressed so it's robust enough and existing on the periphery of the, in the industry. And I thought it was fascinating that you said that most of the wearables are one-offs, fashion one-offs. Absolutely. I mean, they really live by the video alone. Yeah. And, I've cur and I say that because I've curated several... Yeah you know, uh, wearables exhibitions, uh, one notably for the Olympics when they were in Vancouver, and most of the works, they, could ju they just couldn't work. They could not be left on and existing in a gallery space for a few weeks. And even when they did, we experimented. We had a piece by Tekla, and some of the, we wanted the public to get a really positive experience of wearable technologies, you know, to, to be good ambassadors. And one of the pieces said, touch me, and this is one of the most horrifying moments, is uh, this thing that Tekla had made had a tail, and someone was doing this to it, like, literally. And I said, do you work for Tekla? Are you supposed to be, like, doing this? And she said, no, but it says, touch me. So, and I said, well, you're massacring it. But, you know, the, the level of what, of interpretation of what touch me means, of course, is open to interpretation. So for her, it was like, well it should be open to that level of interaction, which it clearly wasn't. It was broken within like 24 hours. It sounded like they were, they were killing it actually, which, which they brings did. up the observation that you said wearables are fragile and bodies are fragile. So that's part of the, the compellingness of this area, I think is its, its fragility, but also its, its you know, imaginative potential. And also our relationship with garments in general. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed immediately that uh, we're, we're accustomed to, when we walk into a clothing store, we're allowed to touch things. And if, even if something is uh, uh, sort of on an art exhibition scale, we still have this relationship with the garment which is tactile and intimate. And so when you put these things out in the world, people want to touch them and they want to have that kind of physical you know, intimacy with it, which you don't think of doing that with a screen. Or you don't, you know, there's many other technologies out there that you don't seek for that level of intimacy. We have one last question. Hi. Salut Thierry. Hey. <laughs> nice to see you again. So it's uh, the Quebec party. The Quebec part. Yeah. <laughs> literally. Concordia part, actually. Yeah. Um, welcome to the IKEA land or Lego land, not so far. Um, well, IKEA was actually sold to Holland, I heard. Really? Yeah, oh. th yeah that's the word on the street. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but let's find out. Let's probe this further. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In, in these kind of places, there's a long history of building it yourself, or a long history of it doesn't have to be a one piece itself. It's a piece that can be changed in the future, or if you miss something, or if you, have a, if you want to build it yourself. Or basically, a lot of creativity involved into it. Have you seen it a change into fashion where it's not necessarily as buying one piece and throw it as it is now, but more and more as you buy it and then you transfer it over time? And do you see electronic wearable bringing a new touch to fashion where people can basically just wave in new electronics or just basically patch it on the fashion and then making it live with another, perhaps another processors that speak to each other and really transform the way that we conceive fashion and the way that we conceive the daily use of or the daily creation of fashion garnets or fashion, the way that we express with fashion in general? I think this idea of, of modularity, uh, I, 
I mean, if that's another way of phrasing your question, is really key. And um, so I was shocked. I don't have a fashion uh, training background, but I was shocked when I started working with fashion designers because they would sew things, and then it would just sort of like rip them apart and correct them. So the, the iterative process of, well, I'll make one, and then I'll expand it, and I'll cut it, and I'll modify it, is really does not work in terms of making a kind of tangible circuit. I mean, once you've made this soft circuit or even a hard circuit, chances are you don't want it to break it uh, or take it apart because breaking it apart puts it at risk of it ever working again. So this aspect of modularity in terms of the creating a circuit and is really apt for garments because any garment is really like a patchwork of things. So you're always working with these junctions, which are essentially super fragile. And uh, I should just mention that there is a huge uh, research consortium that is looking at these connectors, like this issue of connecting things and making things more modular and flexible. So we had Stella, which was one research cluster of which the stretchable circuits was part of, and now the same consortium which involves Philips and the Fraunhofer uh, in Berlin and I think a, a number of other people and engineers are specifically looking at modularity and connectivity. And essentially, what needs to be redesigned is these connection points. I mean, if we can't make the circuit itself softer or more malleable, and I think, like, one of the places where it's happening is uh, actually in children's toys, if you want to talk about robustness. So um, there's a great um, magnet-based um, circuit toy called Little Bits that Aya Badir, who was at MIT and also did some wearables earlier on, put out. I don't know if you know it, but... Um, but you know this is like really sort of like robust and intuitive and you can build things so I'm my hope is for that to happen for fashion in the same way that and that's where fashion designers will really adopt it as a you know really a creative platform thank you ever so Thanks. much I should say also that the whispers project Christina Anderson was also actively involved in that oh. so we've got a nice triangulation across uh, wearables and experimentation and we're going to end now but if anyone has any further questions I'm sure you can find Christina and Valerie around I'd like to thank you thank you, thank you very much